Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. This recording takes place at Gertrude's writing room. Thanks to poet and proprietor Vanessa Shields for making the space available. So our featured guest today is Melanie Janice Barlow. Melanie Janice Barlow is a poet and artist. Her first collection of poetry, Orioles in the Oranges, was listed for the Relit Award, and her essay poems, Detroit, were listed in Best American Essays. She has published in a variety of anthologies and journals in Canada and the U.S and her painting practice includes the Poet Series, a popular portraiture series of contemporary poets, widely received and reviewed. Her latest book, Thicket, was released in fall 2019 by Palimpsest Press. Melanie Janice Barlow lives between her home in Windsor, Ontario, and her her wooden boat, Kalinka, in Toronto. It would be way more interesting if it were a wooden boot, but a boat is good too. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome, Melanie. Hello, thank you for having me. So Thicket, your latest collection is divided into movements. There are conjurings, a long poem, divinations, thick poems, and important postscripts. Very interesting format. What made you decide on that? Well, I think that um, as the book made itself known, I noticed that there were little in-gatherings of, of uh, poems, some being um, more thematically oriented towards one another and others being more formally oriented towards one another. Um, the long poem w- began as a, a, a series and a collection of just poems in general, and I think during the editing process it, it kind of morphed into a long poem with the now famous backslashes and ampersands that kind of made it made it sort of visual texture but that was a that was actually an afterthought to a bunch of poems that gathered together there Hmm. from a thousand questions to a thousand awkward conversations the complicated nature of communication is central to this collection what were your major questions or themes that you were hoping to address in this work Oh, boy. Well, let's see. I mean, a thousand awkward conversations. I mean, so it's, I like that. I like a thousand. There's a thousand geese. I just opened the book and there were a thousand geese also. Apparently one of my favorite (laughs) numbers. Um, Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, coming into my now later 40s, I I just, there's just been a lot of history of relationship to, to look at. And... You know, I can't help but note that um, while many of them are positive and life-giving, a lot of them are fraught, you know, along the way. Um, So I think that I was looking at what happens when, what happens when empowerment occurs in an individual, number one. Um, What happens when one chooses one's path regardless of the thousand awkward conversations that need to be had. One of the probably most influential writers um, and books that I read as a young woman was A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, and I think that that whole uh, section of having the thousand awkward conversations were about having my own room was actually the line. And, you know, my practice as, as an artist and a writer um, was hard won, I would say, in <laughs> no short what order. It was very hard won, and it came with a lot of negative feedback from family and um, a lot of expectations that I had to consider and weigh uh, and defy, <laughs> ultimately. Um, and so it's about communication, but, it, but I'd say it's almost more about a placement of self. A situation, a, a, a situating of self in such a way that um, that one's right to one's own room is not negotiable, and the willingness of that 
then grounded person to have those thousand awkward conversations are a necessary part of that choosing. What kept you going through all those conversations in that hard one room finding? Well, it's interesting, you know, um, I, I'm a Janice, so I come from a giant old Catholic family here. And one of my favorite um, uh, people to talk to in my family is my great uncle Roland, who was a Brazilian priest and an eccentric. He also loved Tai Chi, and he said the F word sometimes, which was quite interesting. <laughs> and he was considered the hippie priest of Windsor for a long time, and he, he uh, presided over Assumption for a very long time. And, um, and so, you know, he and I talked a lot about um, this idea of, like, it's that, that being, that, that, ch that there really isn't a whole lot of choice when it comes to being a writer, an artist, that, you know, not unlike somebody who um, becomes a priest or a nun, it sort of chooses you, you know. Um, I, I always knew. I always knew since I was a little girl that I would be an artist and a writer. I just knew that. And so, you know, it's not, it's not about it being a career choice. It, it becomes about it being a positionality uh, that that one commits to or has to commit to in order to justify the craziness of choosing it um, solely. So, I mean, it's it's a very irrational choice. I actually tell many young people that it is not a good career choice because it. It, it, but it isn't. But that it is also isn't a career choice. So that that's just sort of it for me. You know, I not unlike other people called to other ways of being. And I and I think that there's writers who I mean, not unlike people who choose to commit themselves to faith. Um, you know, there's pe there there are there are different types of writers and artists, and some are perfectly happy dividing their time or um, being more part of the world. I had a really fabulous conversation with a designer who, of course, is more of the world. I mean, it's much easier to align in a capitalistic society as a designer, and they had no bones about that. Um, and then there's people like myself, like, that's all I do. I, I write and I paint. That's what I do no matter what. You know, and, and I, and I kind of think a little bit of, like, the different orders um, some being of the people and being of service in the world and others being more cloistered. And I understand that there's also a lot of gray area in between this type of choice. I'm not saying that, you know, my devotion to what I do is better or worse. It's just the way it is for me. So from your room, um, you look out in this collection onto an urban landscape with you've got images of nature, flora, flora, Fauna, decay, growth. So is that where Thicket comes, the title of the collection comes? No. Not really. No, not Somewhere at all. Somewhere completely different. Oh, yes. I can tell you a great story about where the title Thicket comes from. Do? It really is a great story. Okay. Um, when, um, when I met Phil Hall, he and I became very, very close friends. Um, and he, we the had, poet Phil Hall. of course, yes. yeah, and we had poet. many, many conversations together and about what it, what poetry was and what it meant to be a poet. And, um, and we were, we were more, I mean, although I'm sure I'm not putting words in his mouth, we were speaking of BP Nickel and how Nickel chose once, uh, he was nominated for governor general's award uh, to okay, having scaled up this tree from the forest to look around and see the world from that height, what Nickel chose to do was to climb back down the tree and be a part of, as Phil put it, the thicket of the forest. And Phil asserted that that's where the poets live, and they they find each other in the in the rabbit runs and the foxholes of of the forest, and and that's sort of where. The, the humility comes in in terms of it being that type of a discipline and um, that our poems are like burgies that we throw up and the truth is is that we find likely other poets with because it's not like I'm writing a crime novel or a nonfiction memoir um, you know 
we find each other that way. They're almost just these psychic burgies that we put up and we find each other. And so our conversation became about how the entanglement of being that close to the ground is the, the craft of the poet is to find the community in, in those very solitary pursuits of, 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 of where everything low-lying feels like it also grows together very tightly. And the poet's job is to make sense of that. And that we find each other there is probably the biggest relief of the whole entire endeavor. So that's where the title came from. And, and, and the cover describes it aptly. It, it, it comes from the the sort of enjambment of everything against a person, which I think that we can all really agree has almost thickened uh, uh, as, as, as time goes on in modernity. It's very tightly cast. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that the hope is in the tiny little holes where we find some breath. And I always consider that to be with others. So Fantastic. Some of the portions of this collection are very much situated in the Detroit River region, although it tends to have a dreamy, magical quality in the way that you describe it. How has growing up and living in this region influenced you as a writer? Huh. You know, it's funny, of course. Um, weirdly, so many Windsor-based, Windsor, or people who are from Windsor that I find in the in the and the larger Canadian poetry world, which is so very funny. Um, there are many. I mean, for such a small community, you know, I was just speaking by email with Danny Couture, for example, or Jenny Samparisi, who's also from here, Natalie Zina Wilcox. Like, you know, the list kind of goes on of people who are from this locality that maybe kind of moved elsewhere. Um, so I often joke that there's just something in the like water down here that breeds poets or something. Um, but also, um, it's interesting. Um, my father was born on Cadillac and Jefferson. So my family had funeral homes in Detroit uh, from the mid to late 1800s until they moved over here in the 60s. Um, and so... Like, Detroit is just a big part of my beingness. I mean, we were one of the the first uh, settlers here, um, and which is, you know, is what it is. But that means six generations of my French family were here, and we're also part Ojibwe. So it's this fromness is, import, is important to me. It's, it's not something I... My identity is not something I lead with, but it is definitely... In my bones, this place, you know, there's such a deep familiarity with here uh, that that's bigger than just, oh, I grew up here. And um, the mythos of Detroit was so present in my life as a young person. I came up in the 80s as a young teenager, and of course, I found the new wave scene as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> and... Um, it was just such a an interesting, eely slip across the border to get away from all the rules of same said family with all of their Catholic stuff and their, you know, uh, either their curfews and all that business. And I, I, I could just slip away. And it's very interesting. I actually was at St. Andrew's Hall a few nights ago for the first time since 1989. <laughs> and that's that was a place that I spent a lot of time in the 80s. And um, so I'd say that, that Detroit is in there so much, or this river, or this locale, because it is such a heterotopic place. And by that, I mean it's a place, but it's also a place that holds everything there is to say about, say, America, or about, say, a border, or about all of those things. And it's not utopic. It's heterotopic because it's fraught and beautiful at the same time. So it has this really interesting sense of palimpsest that a lot of writers, I think, like I'm thinking Emily Schultz right now, who's another dear friend, like um, so many of us reach back into here 
Mm -hmm. as a subject matter. And Emily wrote a big long novel about the the, the, uh, the, ri the, the bridge, Ambassador yes, Bridge. The bootleggers, yeah. The bootleggers, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so um, I actually saw her the last time I was in New York and um, you know that is just something that we all hold in common. It just keeps, um, I don't, I mean I, I'm not thinking really hard about this but I just don't know if, a pl if I know of a place that has held the people that write ab that are from here that write about it so strongly, I, I mean, I'd have to think a bit about that because probably Down East does. I'm probably wrong, but but it, maybe everyone feels like that from where they're from. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely a place full of a lot of grist for the mill for me, for sure. Um, so you engage in a variety of disciplines, visual art, poetry writing, essays, and work that combines all of the above, the multidisciplinary work. Um, how do you find time consistently to practice each of these arts, or do you mix them all up together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question I get asked a lot. Um, I, 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 well, let's see. I think that I realized a long time ago that that being interested in the long game was more interesting than worrying about any particular thing happening fast. And I, I'm a Capricorn, so I don't know, I don't know if horoscopes explain everything, but I am kind of true to the nature of the descriptor of a Capricorn in that I really do like rules and I like schedules and I like the challenge of things like moving up the mountain is super fun to me and um, and so I think I approach having a multi-pronged practice as um, patiently and as full of rules and schedules as possible but with because I work for myself I also have the flexibility to allow myself to give in to one particular one that's really exciting for me for a while or like for example Thicket's taken up the last four months of my life just in terms of touring it and whatever so I haven't painted at all and um, I just opened up a textile studio with a dear friend of mine Sarah McCullough called Soft Landings and so I also worked as a leather worker for a lot of years and uh, sold up in shops in Toronto and New York and so what I tend to do um, is I get up very early, I always have, and I work from home with my two 15-year-old dogs and spend some time with them, and I usually either do administrative work or I'll work on what I'm writing. And I often, almost daily, go to Anchor Coffee, which is a fabulous place. I'm really glad that they opened up here in Windsor. And I'll write again for another couple hours, and there's something different about the writing that gets accomplished while I'm there than what gets accomplished at home. And from there, uh, I drive downtown, and um, before this new studio, I just had a painting studio, so I'd spend half a day with writing, half a day with painting. Um, the hope is that, um, as Sarah and I set up the studio, that when I'm breaking from painting and needing a stretch or needing a little bit of a minute to think or let something dry, I write down the hall is where my other studio is in my kitchen's there and my coffee and stuff and it's a very cozy very shared very social space so I can go and we have three we three uh, looms set up for weaving and one of them is a shared project so I can throw a, a shuttle if I just need to think for a bit or um, you know I can put a couple stitches on a project set up that I didn't have to then tuck away back in my basement to get out of my house so I think there's like some systems and some extra meta systems that go on, but what I do find is that that slow and steady wins the race thing is very real. And while maybe I've been writing a little longer than everything else, so it's a bit more of an established practice. You know, I have a show coming up in Detroit next year uh, for some large scale paintings and um, the Poet series has taken a big turn in Detroit with a bunch of new ways the project's articulating. Um, so it just all kind of does what it needs to. I just have to show up every day on time, hopefully, and in the right outfit and do my best. Do you find after you've been away from one particular part of the practice and you pick it up again, it, it's it's got a new perspective or a new freshness or you find new things in it? Yes. 100%, 100%, and, um, and or I make strange with it for a little while. Like, I have, I, I haven't, I've been home for three weeks since being on tour for Thicket, and 
I just kind of go in my painting studio and I'm like, I don't really know what to say. <laughs> and then I just go back and sew, right? For the record, and, Melanie is shaking her head right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like today, actually, after three weeks of being home, is the first time I spent a dedicated amount of hours in there. And it was more just ordering more stretcher bars and um, uh, working on a small commission I promised somebody for Christmas. And it's nothing real yet, but it's at least, <laughs> at least that making strange is kind of past. But I've been through that so many times where I've, you know, it's like a little bit of a creative block, but it's more just like, I don't know what that's all about. But then I usually kind of come around eventually. Mm-hmm. So your poet series, uh, which is Portraits of Contemporary Poets, what led you down the path of painting your fellow poets from the thicket? And, and what are your hopes for that series? Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, if you'd really like me to dish, I'll tell you how I started the poet series. I got in a fight with someone. And it was somebody that I had been friends with for almost 20 years. And uh, they embarrassed me publicly when I was asked if I was a poet. And it was very interesting because I hadn't been writing in a long time. And so I was in that place in that I'm sure many creatives go through where when you're away from a practice, it's very difficult to reclaim the identity. And I, I was with a, quite a famous American poet and this other individual, and he asked me if I was a poet, to which I answered yes. And she sort of guffawed at me and said, well, I thought you were trying to be a painter these days. And a 25-year friendship ended on the spot. And to be honest with you, am I allowed to swear? If you to like. be honest with you, I thought, well, I, I went and I huffed around a little bit, and then I thought, well, you know what? Fuck you then. I'm going to paint poets. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so like, to be really honest with you, it wasn't really like um, the, the inception of this project was kind of anger. And, but, it, but once I like, let it all settle, I realized that it was anger about, or, or, or maybe it was just sadness about how women trash each other and how we're insecure and we try and tilt each other's crown and and how and how we can't just can't love each other and support each other with ease and comfort because there's so much stuff in the way and you know I started thinking a lot about what Phil Hall talked about about the thicket was probably around that time and I thought you know even if even if I don't have the feeling of generosity right now even if I'm hurt maybe especially because I'm hurt it's most important to uh, exercise and flex the muscle of generosity anyway. And so I wondered what would happen if I moved my own ego, which, uh, by the way of which I have a very large one and, and, and work on all the time, out of the way and created a, a series of paintings that gave honor and credit to my contemporaries. And um, it was based on a project that, well, a more a practice that the Detroit-based painter Ann Milikowski had. So Ken um, was, of course, the founder of the Alternative Press um, and, you know, house creative poetic practices of, God, some of America's best poets from the Beats to the Black Mountains, to you name it, went through the Alternative Press. And quietly, his wife Anne was painting miniatures of them and giving them to each individual who passed through the commune that Ken and, and John St. Clair founded and where the press was. And um, there was just something so tender and touching about that ability to um, create a, a visual encomia, really, like a this way of giving honor to other people's beingness that... As I practiced it, as I decided to practice it, really was the bomb for that hurt that started the project in the first place because it reminded me that being kind is always more important than getting ahead by way of stepping on someone else. And so that project was each poet picks the next along many threads. And, you know, it, it, it did very, I mean, it just did what it needed to do. And so I hear, you know, cut to now, your second half of the question was what, what is the plan? Well, I think this project has forced me to look at all of the, all of my, 
you know, the kind of darker turns of my character and question my own impetus or how my own beingness wants to operate. And so up until currently, I was carefully guarding and hoarding the entire project and thinking in a more fearful way about coming up to my 50s and you know this feminism of wanting to be paid as an artist and how that series was my I'm keeping it until somebody buys it you know and it was just like this really like or recognizes it properly or some darn thing and 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 honestly I mean other than like theoretically that's that is right that is right um, it, it really was just kind of me in this pile of portraits of others, you know, in a studio in downtown Windsor. And I was like, this is a little weird. And so um, while I was launching out west, I, I actually had dinner with a very fabulous man. His name is Gregor Jeffries, and he's an ex-boyfriend of mine. And he's like, you know, you, we were talking about my career as a writer and how I, I have all of our friends... Um, I think a heater just turned on, um, you know, actually published and how it was pretty exceptional and that that, that happened. And, and I'm like, yeah, but, you know, geez, this painting thing as a, as a woman, like, it's pretty, the odds are really bad that I will make it as a painter in any way, shape, or form. And he just looked right at me and said, just give away some of your work in very strategic ways. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> you <laughs> say that? What are you talking about? And I, and I felt it here because I knew that if I were really to be true to the nature or the ethos of the project, that I was to go home and give them all to each poet. And actually, um, I just started to give them all away last week and so wow. I've been shipping out portraits um, to each of the poets and 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 this is an interesting juncture between my value as an artist and being paid and trusting messages <laughs> that come very clearly and and you know giving these portraits to the poets adds to my value as a painter because um, because they're out there in the world and because they're with who they're for and because I emphatically trust the generosity of others and um, the my ability to receive generosity. And so it always just comes back around. And as I do that, I'm working on a pretty serious Detroit thread. More to be revealed, mm. I suppose. So long, that was a long-winded answer, but it mm. deserved it, for sure. Yeah, I know some have been exhibited at Biblioasis and, and sort of things. So I was just one. I was, I'm glad to know what's happening to them. It's, mm. it's a lovely, uh, lovely story, and I think mm. it's very generous. Yes. Is there anything you can tell us about the Detroit thread that's coming up? No, not yet? Okay. She, once again, she's shaking her head. <laughs> no, but I can tell you who's been painted thus far would oh. be Ken Milikowski, John Sinclair. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm just trying to think of who else. Um, let me see. Who else is in the... Um, so I'm painting both of the Tishes. I'm painting um, Bill Harris, um, uh, Oliami Dabble, um, Marsha Music, I believe, is in there. Like, really, it's just been quite an exceptional um, beginning. And... Um, I must say, emailing with John Sinclair feels like my weird, nerdy, 19-year-old self who, like, was obsessed with the MC5 is just, like, going, oh, my God, what's happening? So I, I just saw him read at a presentation a few weeks ago. He's right. still quite a presence. Yeah. He very much is. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah. So, it's gathering. The project's gathering steam and... Um, Dennis Teichman's in the project as well, and uh, oh gosh, so many, so many wonderful Detroit poets for sure. Excellent. Mm -hmm. We'll look forward to that. Mm -hmm. And there is a coloring book in the works. I understand. No, there is. Not. There is not. No. Oh. Okay, that's a no. Rumor. That was that was an idea that um, uh, Jay Millar presented to me. Um, Got to be a, probably about two or three years ago that he asked if I would be interested in being the illustrator for um, that project and it never really felt that right for me um, it wasn't what I wanted what I want what I want officially and for the record is an anthology um, where the actual painting is a color plate alongside of uh, 
a poem by the particular poet who I painted. And so there was just like a lot of back and forth with the press. They were really lovely press, but um, they wound up putting my name as the author, which I wasn't because I would have been the illustrator. And it just didn't work out, but we have a put a pin in working together and, and hopefully something else will come of it. Wonderful. Well, we'd like to invite you to read a bit of your wonderful new work, Thicket. Well, okay. Divination 3. Textile sculptures of women assembled at art school in the basement, pausing to inhale, mixing spelt, wheat, soaking babies with giant staring eyes from wooden chairs, pianos under the stairs, blue like the sky, that day we left Montreal behind. New Brunswick fescues, small pieces of carved stone in your fingers, settle you into lonely Dartmouth apartments with bleeding wounds. Lately, we swim too warm and crowded in Parkdale with Polish women, Pervy men walk in the black cloud of high park, nivious, ominous, daring each other to hold on, remembering fluorescent art school classrooms in the black lights in Montreal gay bars, your black cat suit and flu vogs, the guts to enter the Lucien Lallier metro at night. Still wondering why all of the bathrooms there have windows that lead skyward. Still thinking that if it weren't for your offer of recipes that day or how you had to scrub each and every plank of wood in the cracks with bleach sometimes. Divination 4. Lakes bookended, lakes bookended batters and broths, insipate in pots, ingle nooks bookended. Bursting loquacious nettles, rose hips, weed drying somewhere as you teach me how to rag tie my hair, lend me socks, keep the chill off my feet amongst pencil drawing ghosts. The mice keep eating dog food, creep around worn wood. Those bastards, you mutter, lamp prophanies to lamplight with stiff nighttime whiskey that slants sideways, pisses me off. But you are drunk and singing like Rosetta Park, so whatever. Moonflowers, morning glories, souping kale, skinning chicken while farting, wrapping your trusty shawl, set yourself down, knead another pie, kindle another whiskey. Divination 5. Spend your nights device-fingered and lithe with the noises around you forgetting. Edit pictures of Darth Vader with a vacuum, a Dia de los Muertos skull spread-legged on the couch, Spider-Man kissing your son. Use the paintbrush tool as he bangs pots. He runs around in Dufferin Grove Park, naked and mud-soaked. Toronto mothers look down their nose as you drag away at cigarettes, divided, slip through the crowd like Francesca Woodman until you vanish. And we all look through the dark caves later with lamplight, trying to figure out what happened, what went wrong with thriving. I'm going to read the last section since its title is Don't Tie the River Down. <laughs> it seems fitting for this podcast. <laughs> so these would be the important postscripts that we discussed earlier. In it, you keep trying to tie this river down. He knew who I thought I was and so... When you asked, he could clear things up, Charlie girl. In it, the dog shit on the carpet again, always the same spot. He has a tiny straw skeleton that hangs from his rear view mirror. It gives a hula wherever we go. In it, a quiet shimmy. In it, you are a real SOB. She 
is never in her attic studio. In it, we power wash the porch, julienne the carrots. Also, we fuck all day on a new duvet. In it, a triangularity. I collect Norfolk pines because they have stiff spines and soft shoulders. Everything is up and down at the same time. The stars are explosions over Woodward tonight, and we are all skinned in moonlight. In it, hanging ferns, Canadian flags, astroturf, they sit on their porches watching television on their laptops, smoke weed. In it, turf divides, it is so tender, a heart accordion, each chakra lighting up like a light bulb on the upswing, a battle between earth and water. Interactive Geminis, in it a cup of anger ferments into a dangerous scoby. We drink turmeric until our mouths are a yellow-orange, a sweet salty blend. In it, you are a dead giveaway. In it, an inner. Pheasants on brush streak, scattering, multilingual. The skirt of Martha Graham ever twirling. In it, gold tinsel swishing. An old knowing dog crouching, rusts a tin ceiling bent, downwards in it some kind of holy order. Two men in their cups on a beer bottled brown lawn, candles repelling bad spirits, plants reach skywards, old peeling signs, wilted text message, tuning forks, tuning. Ladies dressed in white, lining the walls, whispering. And it's such an inner, the bricks are burning. We are eating garlic sauce and 3D pita and ham trammock with the sun kindling. In it, those bricks are burning. The osteopath says my fascia has become some sort of armor. The stars are on an upswing. In it, an inner, it is so so tender the winter hollows the stalks i'm trying not to become a trope charlie girl a trope throw some shade so you look better don't mind me in it a hard accordion each chakra lighting up like a light bulb on the upswing a battle between earth and water a man with one red nail picks his nose outside of the majestic goes home with a drunk girl in cowboy boots In it, a big black car that drives by us. In it, the porches are loaded. There are tubes of Payne's gray, a a bad poem, some hives along the jawline. Never come up on my porch, no, no knock on my door. We are all from the same heap of salt, ladies. Someone come stoke these rocks, fire up the air until it's so heavy. It smokes. Pheasants on brush street scattering multilingual, the skirt of Martha Graham perpetually turning, the gold tinsel swishing, the beer sweating ball caps, the shade from a tall building casting, ferns against whitewashed concrete, greening, sky blue shirts folded, tuning forks, tuning. Stop measuring my sleeve, Charlie, because in it the men fish for the lost ladies in this bitch of a river. In it these are not poems, these are dead giveaways. You just gave me an Yves Saint Laurent dress a suitor gave you back in Hong Kong. His name was Candy. He liked his cocaine. I wear it to a neighborhood barbecue in Windsor in it an inner In it, my language opposites. I tell you to hang pictures of what happened. In it, the stars are on an upswing. This is a pearly white dashboard, only practical in the AM. I am entering into a relaxed period, Charlie girl, thickening. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.